Welcome to another edition of All Eyes on Egypt. I'm your host, Esther the Blessed Mother. And I'm your host, Asado the Informer. First and foremost, we would like to thank our Supreme Grand Hierophant, and it's it, I further to at Tim Ray, who many know as Reverend Dr. Malachi Z. York L. The main objective here on All Eyes on Egypt is to show our viewers how all aspects in this society come from Egypt, be it science, math, or religion. And we're here today to prove to you beyond any doubt with undisputable facts. We decided to do a two-part special on each of the major religions to show you how they originated from Egypt. Today we will start with Judaism and show you step by step how the major characters had close dealings with Egypt. We ask that you please have a Torah or Bible close at hand so that you can follow along and not have to believe us. Today we have with us Brother Kafri Sa Atun who will talk to us about this topic. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And we're going to start off with what is the meaning behind Hosea 12.9? And before, previously, we, we read from, um, I have the New American Standard, and you right. have the King James Version, right. and it's a distinct difference there. And we want to, um, I'll read from the okay. New American Standard first. It says, Hosea 12.9, But I have been the Lord your God since the land of Egypt. I will make you live in tents again, as in the days of the appointed festival. I have also spoken to the prophets, and I have... I gave numerous visions, and through the prophets, I gave parables. God of the Bible, in verse 10, confirms it. That saying that this was the God of the prophets, the one that gave the prophets their visions, gave them instructions to carry out the things that they carried out throughout the Bible. But it's clearly saying that this God is from Egypt. Mm -hmm. Now, what's a little confusing about it is, all throughout the beginning of the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, num Numbers, this God refers to himself as the God of um, Israel. But as we go later in the show, that, that name and that title will be broken right. down for you, too, so right. you can link both in. And also, we, we know that you have the King James Version, and we would like to make a distinct difference here because hers says since. And right. I think yours says, read that for us. Right. Um, mine, mine starts out, uh, again, this is the uh, book of Hosea, chapter 12, verse 9. It says, and I am, I, I'm sorry. And I that am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt, which more in this King James version of the Bible, it's making, you know, no, there's no type of distinction. It's clearly saying right. that this is the God, that he's the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt, which more in this King James version of the Bible, it's making, you know, no, there's no type of distinction. It's clearly saying right. that this is the God that he's laying claim to his home as being Egypt. Right. Right. There it's a little bit different now. Right. And, and later also in the show, it'll be shown the origin of the Bible and why these things were done. There is a difference between translations because we're, you know, we're taught that as we go to church that a Bible's a Bible, if the reverend's holding it, that there's nothing wrong with it. Right. But it's good to do the, the research and the history of these translators and the origin of these books because there is a difference, and you'll see as we go through some of these things where, where it ties in. Right. That's, that's true. And also, just to spin off on that before we go into the next question, that there is a major transgression by them going into the scriptures because right. in the scriptures itself it says that not one jot or iota shall be changed. From, that's right. So the minute that your reverend goes in now, these so-called scholars right. go into the scriptures and change them, and they are, in fact, uh, making transgressions against the law that is stated in the book that they say that they follow. That's right. <clears throat> that's true indeed. So uh, tell us, how, how did the God of the Bible you know, feel about the Egyptians? Well, I mean, as you look through the Bible, the funny thing is you'll talk to uh, most religious schools of thought, religious people. Uh, today, in modern religion, Egypt is, is portrayed as a paganistic society, that the Egyptians were pagans. But when you read the Bible, you get a totally different uh, concept of, of how the so-called God of the Bible felt about the Egyptians. Because again, as we go later in the show, you'll see that anytime there was a problem, this God of the Bible sent 
his most beloved people or prophets to Egypt because Egypt was always flourishing, it was always prosperous, and any time something, or it was a place for these prophets to reside when there was times of danger or famine. But uh, according to the Bible, how, how he must have felt about Egypt according to what's recorded there and not according to what ministers, preachers, and so-called scholars are trying to tell us about Egypt, he felt highly of Egypt because it was a, it was a, 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 a land of great people, a land of wealth, and it was, there wasn't problems existing there as it did as we get into some of these stories. So, I mean, I, based on what the Bible says, I mean, he felt, how he felt about the Egyptians was, it was all positive, how it was recorded in there. Right. And that was his home, as he stated yeah, in Hosea 12.9. 12, right. So, right. Right. so uh, and what is the true origin of the Bible? Now, that, 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 that's a detailed topic that, again, what I was saying earlier, if you take the time to research the translations and the origins, the stories in itself, you will see as you go into ancient Egypt, a lot of these characters, you'll see these same stories recorded in ancient Egypt in the pyramid text, the temples of Karnak, on the walls, they're still carved there. You'll see, uh, for an example, we won't, we'll get later in more, more in the detail the story of Moses. You'll find similarities between the Ten Commandments, Ark of the Covenant. You'll see stories recorded in the Bible, such as baptism, circumcision, etc. You'll see a lot of these rituals and these stories and these characters, they were ex ex um, actually they were Egyptian characters, but what happened is later these translators came along later, translated the Bible, changed the names. Therefore, today we're, we are confused to exactly who these people are. So. Right. And, and that brings me, I'm sorry, that I was reading the Book of the Dead okay. a couple of days ago, and it made me think of um, Cain and Abel, where he right. was bringing that correlation of exactly who Cain and Abel were. Good point. And their twins as well. Can you, you want to expound on okay, that? Okay, here's, that, that, that's a good example to look at the similarity. The story recorded in the Bible was Cain slew his brother Abel out of jealousy. The story is recorded in Genesis as Cain was asked to join the priesthood of Malachi, Zadok, or Melchizedek later on in the Greek in the New Testament. And to show his worth, he was supposed to give an offering to prove he was worthy to be part of that sacred order. Right. Now, when you go into the story of, of Osiris and, and Set, you'll see that Set was jealous of his brother Usir because he was a great ruler at that time in ancient Egypt, and he wanted that, that fame, that power, and that same claim to the throne of Egypt. So again, just like Cain slew his brother Abel out of jealousy, Osiris or Usir did the same thing to his brother. And again, that's not a coincidence. When you read the stories in detail in the Bible, and if anybody out there has a book of the dead or is familiar with Egyptology, you'll see that it's not a coincidence. That's one right. thing we teach in our doctrine. There's no such thing as a coincidence. Right. Exactly. So it's not a coincidence that, that set, set off to right. try to kill right. Osiris. That's right. right. And, and Cain set off to try to kill Abel. Right. So, and we know that the Egyptians, beyond a shadow of doubt, predate the, the characters of the Bible. That's right. right. And those four brothers and sisters being Abel and Achlemia, right. being Osiris and Oset, right. and um, Labuda and Cain, right being set in nepotism. Right, right. So, um, obviously, that's where all of it started and began. Of course. Mm -hmm. So, why is it today <coughs> that people, mainly the believers of the Bible, put such a negative connotation, or the writers of the Bible put such a negative connotation on Egyptians? <coughs> Again, for lack, lack, we like to use the word overstanding because that's being above standing, as rather as the understanding where you're below actually knowing the truth. Uh, the reason for that is, again, to conceal the truth, mainly for, for um, what we term Nubians, people of color, Africans, Latinos, to hide that sacred truth in there. Because when you see that the origin of all these truths stem back to ancient Egypt, it will open, you know, open your mind to other things. You'll see that there was more, there's more to it than they tell us. So they, like I said earlier, they took these, these stories and these people and changed the names to hide that sacred meaning. Because it takes on a whole different context as opposed to the religious contact they gave us and then you also have to go back to who were these people that translated these stories and what was their purpose mm -hmm. for taking our scriptures and translating them changing the names because most of us here in America today we're reading a King James version of the Bible that were translated by Europeans people from England this Bible was translated for the Angl Anglican Church for the laymen of Europe and no no brothers and sisters here in America are laymen of Europe they don't speak classical English we don't speak for our thou whence thou this is not the scripture or the book or the stories that we read in our original form so basically the intent for them, giving Egypt a negative uh, you know, theme to it and making it look negative is to keep us discouraged from it. Right. So we don't look deeper into it. Right, that's true because they even went so far as, and perhaps our producer can get a clip of this, they even went so far as, because the clip is in the Ancient Egypt and the Pharaoh's book okay. where Atom Ray shows that you have Caucasians inside of the tombs literally right. changing the faces and oh, yeah. figures of, the, of our ancestors because right. they knew 
that one day we will crack those tombs. Of course. And so they That's had an excellent to, point. Had to go to that such a, I mean, such an extremity, <laughs> you know, That's to do right. that right there. So if you was here first, then why are you doing that? Why would you even go into inside the, the tomb? I mean, you if if you can't, like, like what we're taught by our Supreme Grand Hierophant, you can find all different races and nationalities of Nubians on the wall from from high yellow to dark brown, from, from straight to wavy to curly hair, but one thing you don't find is what's called in ancient Egypt the blonde-haired, blue-eyed Tama, who right. you don't find them on the wall. And again, it's not racism, it's just scientific facts. We don't, right. we don't teach hate or racism in our doctrine, but fact is, it's a scientific fact, and science has confirmed it, that civilization started in what they call Northern Africa, or Nubia, or over there in the Aswan, Sudanese, Egyptian era, whatever title you want to give it, it's a scientific fact civilization started over there in ancient Egypt. It's not racism, and that's the main reason why these Bible translators want to give Egypt such a negative, you know, connotation and, and, and have it looking bad like it's paganistic because they, if you research who the ancient Egyptians were, they were Africans. Right. That's true because just to stay on this for a minute, you know how I feel about this topic here, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but to stay on this for a minute, you know, they played the race game. They started the race game. True so now we're So now we're going to finish it. That's right. You know, so, you know, they, they make they move. Now we're making our move to set this record straight. With facts. With right. facts. Not violence like they do and cause wars and hatred and start, you know, chaos all over the planet. We're going to do it with mind and the intellect and facts so, so our people can look these things up. And then mentally, once, you know, once that spell is unlocked from us mentally, then it opens up new doors for us. That's right. That's, that's right and exact. And I'm going to stop you two right here because we have to go to a quick break. But okay. when we come back, we're going to um, get into some of the characters and also um, explain to our people that actually these are fictitious characters right. to some extent right. that they were um, uh, created out of numerous people. So Correct. we're going to get on that and talk um, about some of the major characters in the Torah and the Old Testament. So please come back. As the mysteries of Egypt treat you, the secrets of of the pyramids and the scientists that built them. Well, now you can have these secrets. Now you can enter into ancient Egyptian order and learn who and what you are. Who built the pyramids? Why? Medicine, alchemy, the secrets of symbolism revealed to you. Enter the ancient Egyptian order now, now, now. Welcome back. For those of you who are just now tuning in, we've been talking about the correlation of the Bible and Egypt, and it's dealing with Egypt with Brother Hafri Sa Atun. And now we're going to get into the fictitious characters of, of the Bible, namely Abraham. We're going to deal with him first. And we say he's a fictitious character because you find no record of Abraham with inside the walls of Egypt. So what is the reason for this fictitious character of Abraham coming to Egypt, <clears throat> okay, uh, according to the Bible. When you read in Genesis chapter 12, verse 10, you'll see that uh, at that time Abraham was dwelling near the mountain called Har, which is on the other side of the Caucasus mountain region. And at that time there was a great famine in the land of Har. So he was sent to Egypt for hospitality and basically for food. Uh, and again, that, that, that goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning of the show with Egypt. It, it, you'll see as we go through these stories, it seems like any time that people were hungry, <laughs> right. they went to Egypt, Egypt and Egypt right. had no problem with no food exactly. you, know, you know, through the years. But that was his main reason for, for going to uh, Egypt. But you'll see as the stories progress out of his seed, we know that the biblical characters from Abraham on down to Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, you'll see it was all family lineage. It takes on a greater purpose when we get into the story of Jacob and Joseph later on. Okay. And um, I want to go to Genesis 17 and 5. Um, I'm going to read it. Mm -hmm. Is it 17? Yeah. Sure. It's 17 and 5. Okay, it says, No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I will make you the father of a multitude of, a multitude of nations. Um, in this verse, why does God, why is there a need to change his name? And okay. what is the origin of this name if we deal with it? Okay, the name Abram uh, meant an exalted father. Uh, then it was changed later on, as you, that quote you just read there, was changed later on to the father of many nations, because the question you just asked before that, you'll see as the story progressed out of Abraham's seed, he would be the father, according to the biblical stories as right. we go along with this, he would be the father of many nations and many seeds. But then when you come into ancient Egypt, they took his Chaldean name, and according to their language, they translated it as Ab, meaning father, Ra tining to the sun deity, Ra or Re, depending on what dynasty you were dealing with, and then the word Ham or Ham meaning black or blackness. Right. 
So that's what the ancient Egyptians translated Abraham's name, as, you know, name as. But as we get, you get later in, we'll see. But that was the reason for his name being changed because, according to this this here in this quote, this God of the Bible stated to him that many great nations and people would come out of your seat. So that was the reason for the name change. Right. right. And not only that, the God that who said in Hosea twelve nine that he was <laughs> from back, Egypt, and we're right. get back to once that again <laughs> that gave him a up. name. That was that Egyptian. Had it, that was Egyptian. That's right. And we're right. gonna you'll see as we go through the show, we're gonna keep going back to that quote continuously. Right. right. That's true. Okay. Because obviously, you know, God has great reverence, for reverence Egypt. for Egypt. That's right. I mean, it's only obvious. It's right here, and we're here to dispel all this misinformation that has been presented by the concealers of the truth. It is in this day and time that our supreme grand Howard fans, Nati Aferdati Atamray, is here to wake us up. That's right. <clears throat> And to give us and show us how these things correlate, and to see how it was it was just taken and it was changed and it was people's name was changed and restored at places was changed and so much confusion. But we give thanks that he is here That's in right. this day and time to clear up the confusion. That's right. And you know it's, it's, it's very important what, what our Supreme Grand Hierophant has always taught us over the years. We we as Nubian people. We never ever take time to research any Semitic right. languages of the scriptures. And really, that's how they've been forced to spell real hard on us over the last couple hundred years. We don't take time, if we so-called say we're Hebrews, we don't take time to learn Hebrew. Mm -hmm. If we say we're Christians, we don't take time to learn Greek. Right. If we say we're Muslims, we don't take time to learn Arabic. There is a significance in the language, and you'll learn that as we, you know, right. as we continue on. And that's a good point to interject here, I'm sorry. Okay. But our Supreme Grand Hierophant is the only one that has come and, and presented a new language. That's right. For his congregation, we would do a show based on that language. But again, right. you know, we are living the whole aspects of the Egyptian culture, not just from the, from the vast knowledge, but from everything from books to games, you know, every everything that we That's have. Right. And we have everything, all aspects of Egypt we have. That's and we right. are practicing it and living that right now because we are ancient Egyptians walking around today. That's right. <clears throat> so, okay, we're going to go to Hagar. You know, who, who is Hagar? And is this an Egyptian name? No, Hagar is not, it's not an Egyptian name. Again, okay. it's, it's, it's funny how we were just talking about the languages. Again, actually, who Hagar was, her real name in ancient Egypt was Hakware, and she was the daughter of Emotep. And again, as we mentioned Abraham earlier, and you'll see as the story has evolved, here's a more detailed explanation. This is actually how Abraham got into ancient Egypt by way of Hakware, him being a Nubian, Chaldean, Babylonian, whatever terminology you want to attribute to it. Uh, they took her, replaced her with that name, Hajar Hakware, but actually they also tie, Hakware tied into the uh, ancient Egyptian deity Hathor. And you also, a lot of people out there that have read the Bible are familiar with the cow or the calf story of the Israelites when so called Moses was up on Mount Hor receiving the commandments and Aaron and the Israelites were waiting below the mountain. And again, I'm saying this how it's recorded in the Bible. Right. I'm not passing this on as truth. I'm saying this is how they recorded it. And they were impatient and they built a golden calf. And everybody that's familiar with ancient Egypt knows that the deity Hathor, one of her symbols, and you see pictures are depicted with the calf horns. Mm -hmm. right. But that was actually the link where they left and the mistake that they did. Right. You got to always know this, like you said earlier, the, the devil plans a plan, but the most high, right. or whatever you want to refer to him as, has a better plan. plan. Right. So they actually replaced the deity Hakure with this fictitious character called her jaw. She, mm -hmm. she, again, when we say fictitious characters, we're saying that how they termed them in the Bible weren't real. Like, like the sister was saying at the beginning of the show, some of them were real, some of them weren't, some of their names were changed, the stories, they took this character from here, put them there, and now we got chaos. So that's right. what we're here to mm -hmm. try to clear that right. chaos up. Right. That's, that's who her jaw was. Her real name was Hakwa Ray. Right, that, okay, very good. And um, in Genesis, it's, it's funny that we're dealing with names because um, <laughs> it's, it's like, they were given names, and who, who gave them these names? That's and right. supposedly it's the God oh, of Hosea. Yeah, right. yeah, okay. Okay. So once again, in Genesis 16, 11, um, God tells Hagar to, um, to name her child a specific name. Mm -hmm. And if you want to you go on from there. Right. The name, again, the name Ishmael in the Hebrew language, it means El will hear. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then as you get further into that story, he also promised out of this, this uh, person called Ishmael, many great nations would be born. Right. And then when you get later on, you'll see that Ishmael took an Egyptian wife, right. and this wife was given to Ishmael, 
Now, again, there's that link, again, with Egypt. Mm -hmm. It's so funny how we're dealing with a, a, a Jewish or Hebrew Bible, but Egypt keeps popping up. Right. 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 That's true. Right. And, and if God is so anti, the, the God of the Bible is so anti-Egypt, why does he keep giving people Egyptian names, sending people to Egypt, right. and telling him to, you know, <laughs> allowing him to to have some of his chosen people choose wives from Egypt. Right. right. And, and why is that famine in, in so-called so holy land? Right. You know, Israel. It was chaotic then and it's chaotic That's now. right. <clears throat> and it would, to bring that up with the wife thing, to further touch on that, at the Ishmael story, you'll see in Genesis 21:21 the name of Ishmael's wife was Fatima. Okay. And you'll see in that quote, for those at home that are watching, can look up Genesis 21:21. <laughs> it Ishmael. clearly makes the distinction that she was an Egyptian. Right. So okay. again, this is the God of the Bible, like, like the sister keeps saying from Ho uh, Hosea 12, 9, who was an Egyptian guy, because that's, that's where he laid the claim to his home. Right. Why, why promise this, th uh, an Egyptian woman, who they falsely call her jaw, who we know is Hakare, promise her a great seed, who they call in the Bible Ishmael, and then it's made sure, it's pointed out to you, that he, she, he takes an Egyptian wife named Fatima, according to the Bible, and a great seed will come out of, out of these people. Mm -hmm. So again, go, you, you, mean, you can look that up for yourself. Right. Also, let's go scroll on down through the Bible here, and I like how we how we doing this here because we want it's, our main objective here is to make sure that our viewers really get this information. So, if you're an honest seeker of the truth, sit down right as we go through these quotes. If you don't have a Bible, write them down. You know, but it, please get this affirmation because this is a once in a lifetime phenomenon that we have this this affirmation so uh, willingly giving to us. Excuse me for my <laughs> lack of words there. But in Genesis uh, 16, 13, who is the Lord that Hagar calls out to, and where is his origin from? Okay, if you read, if you read in that quote, um, the name of the deity recorded in that quote is called uh, El Roy. Uh, now, if, if we could, if you would briefly, uh, there's a translation that our Supreme Grand Hierophant has done, uh, what, what they call the Torah, or the first five books of the Old Testament. <laughs> and again, he's probably one of, he is Excuse one of the only men that has actually taken all the monotheistic right. scriptures that exist today and, and translate them with the original Hebrew in there, English, the Greek, depending on what you're reading. Mm -hmm. But in page 202, if we could read real briefly, okay. we can give you a detailed explanation of the origin of, of uh, El Roy. And again, it means in the Hebrew, the seer. But uh, I'd just like to point this out. Um, I, the name El Roy, this is page 202. Okay. The seer mentioned in Genesis 1613 as the name of a Yahuwah that her jar called on was the El. The story goes, she called on the name Yahuwah that's spoken to her. And the Hebrew word for Seeth is the, is the word Roy, which they get from the name Roy, R-O-I. Um, it also continues, uh, it says that, a, a, as you go later on in this, you'll see, as we were talking about right before that, when we were saying that she was actually Hakuare, she was an Egyptian, and everybody knows that the highest deity upheld in ancient Egypt was a deity Ra or Re. And you right. can hear the phonetic, the, the sound El Roy, El Ra. Right. The L just in Hebrew is just a definite article. It just means the. the. So mm -hmm. the seer, and in Arabic it would be Al. Right. So that's who she was actually calling on was the son deity Ra because it would make sense as we proved prior to this she was an Egyptian. Right. So that's, that's actually what, what the name El Roy is and the deity she was calling on was the son deity Ra. Mm -hmm. and, and he did spare her and when you read that whole story, the instance because with, right. with the situation with water, she, she was starving and her, her prayers were so called answered right. according to the Bible when you read right. the story. Okay. Right. So, and just, <clears throat> excuse me, just undisputable facts. And right. Thank you for being so uh, astute with, your, with the knowledge here. Right. Right. Well, I, well, like I said, this, this is not, it's not just me, it's all of us sitting up here. This is what right. the Supreme Grand Hierophant is raising. Right. Exactly. You know, just, just think there's, there's hundreds and thousands of us walking around, not just in Georgia, we're all over the world now. Right. Oh, that's scary. It is, but it's, it's good because it's needed. And right. this is the right. type of minds that he's raising. So. Right. So, it's, it's a bunch of us walking around like this, men and women. Right. right. But we're going to go to break right now because we have to go to Napa Supreme News, Anuket Asado. Um, and we, but when we come back, we're going to go back into some more of the characters, uh, namely Jacob and Joseph, okay. and tie them into Egypt as well. Okay. So viewers, please stay tuned and come back here with us on All Eyes on Egypt. I am always asked, why am I here? I am always being compared to the other Nubian leaders that take you nowhere. It's confusion. They teach illusions. It's just confusion. We have come a long way. 
Yet we are nowhere. We have many Nubian teachers out there teaching illusions. It's all confusion. That's why I'm here. Hotep and welcome to NABA Supreme News. My name is Anuket Asaru. These last two weekends have been hectic for Nubian organizations in Georgia, kicking off on Friday evening with the Athens County Branch NAACP Freedom Fund Banquet, where many outstanding citizens, such as Nefir Aferti Atum Ray, who was introduced as the Deputy Grand Master Mason over the Southeast region, and Michael L. Thurmond, Commissioner of Labor, were honored in the elegant setting of the Georgia Center for Continuing Education. Saturday saw the opening of the Georgia Association of Elected Black Officials, GABIO's, annual fall conference in Monticello, Georgia, partnered with seven other organizations to promote the Get Out the Vote message, SCLC, NAACP, Rainbow Push, GCBW, and others came together, according to GABIO President and State Representative Tyrone Brooks, to utilize all resources, energy, and time to organize, motivate, and demand the largest turnout of African American and minority voters since the enactment of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. A lot of work. Still, some Gabio members were able to take a break and get loose that evening at a jamming beach party given by the Egyptian Church of Christ on their beautiful land, Tamare, Egypt, Egypt of the West. Southern Christian Le Leadership Conference's U Reunion Committee, headed by a prominent Nawabian, the Honorable Tyrone Brooks, honored one of, of our unsung heroes, the legendary Reverend Jose Williams. From a host of world players and Nawabian rights supporters, such as Reverend Jesse Jackson, Reverend Al Sharpton, Mrs. Coretta Scott King, Ambassador Andrew Young, comedian Dick Gregory, Mayor Bill Campbell, and Governor Roy Barnes, and many more. But you never had a question of where he stood, because he would tell you right away. And after he told you, it was like moving Mount Rushmore to try to change it. Uh, you all know that. When Dr. King suggested that Jose join us in Atlanta, I said, Jose could be the first black congressman from the South. We looked at the map, and that first congressional district around Savannah had the greatest potential. And I said, we really ought to give him the choice whether we're going to work with him down there and help him to become the first black congressman from the South. or whether he wants to come and join us. I said, now, he ain't like the rest of these folks we've been recruiting. James Aaron didn't have nothing. He was slinging hash. Bernard Lafayette was a student. And um, Connie Curry did have a job with the American Friends Service Committee, but Jose had a house. I mean, Jose had a big ranch-style house down in the suburbs, what you call it? Thunderbolt. Jose had the longest Cadillac, I had a long Cadillac in the been. And Jose always had a roll in his pocket. And was sharp. And I said, we don't know whether we are gonna be able to get him to come to Atlanta. He didn't hesitate. I wanted to be here because Hosea Williams has always been there for us. I wanted his family to know that there is no region or generation that is not indebted to Hosea Williams. I remember in 1986 when they killed a young man in Howard Beach in New York City. Jose flew to New York and marched with us. When those of us who went through the movement talk about Jose's contribution, one word that always comes up is courage. Indeed, courage has truly been the hallmark of Jose's life. From his leadership to 
of the Savannah Movement, to Bloody Sunday on the Edmunds Pettus Bridge, to the Scope Campaign, March Against Fear and Intimidation in Fourth Island County, to the difficult personal struggles. And in the last year, he's faced serious health challenges. But his courage remains a palpable force, and it still inspires us today. Martin Luther King Jr. is celebrated as a brave man, but I remember the day that Martin said to me that Hosea had more raw courage than anyone else I know. <laughs> Jose Williams, known as Unbossed and Unbought, spearheaded the SCOPE program which brought over 1,100 Northern students to help register Southern voters in the 60s. He also organized the Poor People's Campaign to demand a minimum standard of living and was instrumental in getting the Voting Act passed. As chief executive, Jose's Feed the Hungry and the Homeless Campaign in Metro Atlanta annually assumed responsibility for feeding thousands of Atlanta's homeless during the holidays. Also present were veteran civil rights activists whose willingness to put their lives on the line to change the condition of their people resulted in many rights being won, such as voting, that we take for granted these days. Men and women like Jose Williams, whose contributions and achievements cannot be measured, but whose experiences, once heard, can change the inertia that grips some, some of us today. Their unconditional love and drive for right action towards all peoples like that of our beloved Natia Aferti Atumre, touches all those who come in contact with them. Thank you for watching Nava Supreme News. My name is Anuket Asaru. Have a good week and tune in next week. Well, we were the first and we will be the last. Let me take you back to an ancient land called Tarites. Later calls Mitzrayim or Egypt by the Canaanites. Thank you, Anuket Osado. She always does such a great such job. A Thank you for bringing us Naba Supreme News. And for all of our viewers who are just now tuning in, we've been talking to Kafri Sa Atun about the correlations of religion and Egypt. And for all of those who have questions, please you can call us at 447610029 or you can email us at all eyes on Egypt TV at yahoo.com. Again, that's all eyes on Egypt TV at yahoo.com. And now we're going to deal with the, some more uh, fictitious characters that have been, okay. uh, you know, overlaid from the true Egyptians, deities that live. Right. And we're going to deal with uh, Jacob. And then let's read Genesis 32, 22 through 30. First of all, who is this physical God that Jacob is wrestling with? And before you start reading, as you find it, I would like to, to state claim that you know, it is a physical God that, that we're talking about here. So all the spook spirit uh, God that we've been taught about Christianity, how can God wrestle if he's a spirit? Right. So, uh, so please, uh, you know, just think about that. I'm oh. going to read. I, we happened to be leaving here one day, and I was reading through, and I was like, Listen, look at this, you know, and I was just showing him this, and it really caught my attention because I was like, I'd never seen this before. All right, it never jumped out at me before. But I'm going to read uh -huh. um, 24... I think through 32. It says, Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. And when he saw that he was not prevailed against him, he touched the socket of his thigh, so the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated while he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Okay, the he and stuff, is a little confusion there. And it actually, sort of gets you confused because it keeps right. saying he, he, and but he, he ver who. Verse 24, the first verse you read, it specifically identified this so-called God as a man. Man, exactly. Man. Okay. Right. Which, again, everybody out there speaks English. We live in the United States of America. Yeah, man, he, that's associated with human attributes. Right, exactly. That's right. And wrestling. I mean, uh, if somebody's wrestling not, with no. you... He might have been in the WWF. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, so he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Mm -hmm. And he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. Right. Keep, that, keep that in mind, because right. we're going to go back there. For you have strifed with God and with men and have prevailed. Mm -hmm. Then Jacob asked him and said, please tell me your name. But he said, why is that you ask my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob named the place Peniel, and he said, I have seen God face to face. 
yet my life has been preserved. Right. right. Mm -hmm. Now, the funny thing about that is it, all, it also says in, in, in the book of Exodus, nobody shall see God's right. face. Face to face, right. right. Again, I mean, that's getting into something else. But the key, like I said, it's, it's referring to man and he. Now, again, what we were talking about earlier with not being familiar with the languages, I think if anybody out there had any, and again, you don't have to be, we're not saying be a Hebrew and Arabic scholar whiz. That's not what we're saying. Right. Right. You can go get a Hebrew and Arabic dictionary or the many translations that our Supreme Grand Hyphen has put out because he's one of the few authors when he writes a book, he gives you the quote in English with the Hebrew or Arabic or Greek text and then he gives you an explanation for it. Right. But again, when you, in the Hebrew, the word that they used to describe what, what in Greek they called an angelos. In, in Arabic, it was Alahuma, but here in Hebrew, the word Elohim meant these beings. Mm -hmm. This was one of many beings. In ancient Egypt, we called them Niterat, mm -hmm. or which was a host of beings, deities, gods, whatever terminology you would like to use in English. So who this God was, this was one of the many, again, for Christians, could probably relate to the word angels. This is one of the many angels or Elohim that as you read through your Bible, and regardless of what denomination you are, you'll see there were many angels in these stories at the time when they came to Abraham's tent, uh, Luke in the New Testament, when it talks about the birth of Christ. There was many times you see recorded in the Bible where these angels, these Elohims, whatever word you need to use, appeared to men to, to accomplish something, to reveal something, or to, put, you know, to give a level of information to a certain prophet or a person. So basically, you'll see that, what, that was one of the many Elohims of angels. And again, it's nothing spooky. Like the brother said, we don't deal with spooks, apparitions, or spirits. These were just beings that personified in, in human form. And if you deal with religion, you have to say that's true because Christianity teaches that, that Jesus is God in the flesh. Right. So you can't say God is not personified right. in the flesh. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. so that, that, was, that is important that he said that he saw, I have seen God face, face to face. face. So obviously, face to face means that God there was a God physical face. 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 Yeah. Right. Okay. That's you know? right. So, I mean, that's something that we overlook, and I know that it's being overlooked in churches. Nobody points this out in your church and says, okay, you know, look at this, you know, and, and pay attention to this. People somehow overlook this fact. Because, right. again, because, you know, it's hard to hide these contradictions. Then Numbers 23, 19 says that God is not a man also. Right. right. So, again, if it's if referring in this quote that this God that Jacob wrestled with and encountered, again, it's referring to him as a he. It's referring to him clearly in verse 24. It says man, man right. or enos in the Hebrew, or mortal. Okay. Right. Now, these are things, like the sister said, cannot be overlooked right. because, right. you know, the pastor, will, again, it's not their fault because they've been indoctrinated and embedded. they got a criteria they're supposed to teach by. Right. Most of them go to these seminaries and these so-called schools where they have a criteria. So when you come at them, when you catch them all guard, and they'll, then they'll give you some spiritual interpretation right. of what that is, brother. You see, that's the you know, the spirit, or they'll give you some whacked out interpretation. But we, we here at the Egyptian Church of Christ, we say stick strictly to the scriptures. Right. That's not what the Bible says. That's nice that that's what you said. That's how you interpreted it. Mm -hmm. But we're trying to say word for word in the book of Genesis, it says man, it says he. There's no getting around that. Right. Right. So let's build from there, and then the truth will come out. Right. And again, for those of you who, may, who might have missed that quote, it is Numbers 23, 19 that he quoted, where it right. says that that God is a man. God right. is not a man. Oh, God is not right. a man. I apologize. Right. And we just read Genesis 32, um, 22 through 30. Right. That's where you'll find out about um, the wrestling of Jacob with this man who he saw face to face, who said that, uh, who he recognized as God. Um, and also, I pointed out too about his name. He changed right. his name to Israel. Right. Mm -hmm. So let's deal with what is Israel. Okay, the name actually in the Hebrew language, it's pronounced with I yes. Rael, and what, what that means uh, simply in the Hebrew language, it means El prevails. In Arabic, Israel, if anybody out there is familiar with Islam, you'll see the word Isra means to ascend in the Arabic language, and then El, which was a definite article for El, El Elo, or Elohim. So when you're saying Israel, the, Arab, the Arabs or the Muslims referred to as ascending to El, and when you're saying Israel, it means El will prevail. That's what the name was translated at. And again, that name was changed because of that story that we just read in Genesis 32, verse 20 to 30, the wrestling. A lot of people out there might have seen movies on or heard the term Jacob's Ladder. Right. right. That he had to wrestle all night with this God, and he ascended up a ladder, so-called, they say, mythologically, to heaven. Mm -hmm. He ascended the heavens to wrestle, to try for, for, to wrestle this Elohim, this God, for, for a blessing. So that's, that's why the name was changed, because basically, simply, because of the incident that happened in that story. But again, also, when you study the Egyptian mysteries, the name Israel takes on a different meaning. If you look closely into the origin of that name, you'll see three de deities mentioned in that mm. from ancient Egypt being Isis, Ra, and El. And even when you get into the word Genesis, 
in the Egyptian mystery is taught that Genesis actually is the genealogy of who the Greeks call Isis. Mm. So again, basically what we're saying is, and as we go along and we clarify a lot of these stories, everybody knows that the word Genesis comes from genealogy. Basically when you're reading the first five books of the Old Testament, what the Hebrews call the Torah, and we'll get into that later, that came from another Egyptian deity, Tawaret, but we can we get into okay. that another time. <laughs> but basically what that's dealing with there, we're getting the genealogy of our ancestors. Right. This is all we're, we're dealing with. A lot of people pick this book up and cause wars and violence and separation mm -hmm. over it. It's a history book. Right. It's just to know your history. It really doesn't have no significance mm -hmm. in this day and time because we're dealing with AIDS today, crack. We're dealing with um, violence, murder, as right. we turn on the news. This is not going to solve these problems. The truth right. will. So basically, this, it's a history book, and we have to keep that in mind as we, as we go through these right. stories. And that's true. Right. And also, according to the book, uh, you know, the God who they believe in, you know, name the Christians is Jesus. You know, he makes a direct blood link. That's right. So if it, so that your God feels that bloodline, blood lineage is important. Oh, of course. You know, so now we, what the Tamil who have done to us, Nubian people, they have come in and severed our blood link and inserted themselves inside that. So now we're looking at them right. as, as, as a God-like figure. That's right. And we need to erase that from our minds and make that blood lineage with ourselves. Right. And that is back in Egypt, undoubtedly. And we're going to prove to you each week, That's a time good after time, we're going to go through these scriptures until we get this affirmation into your head right. and into your heart. <laughs> and all praise go to our Supreme Grand Hada family. Exactly. And I further to you, Atom Ray. <clears throat> For waking us up and giving us this right knowledge. Because without him and without this knowledge, we could still be out there looking and That's believing right. and searching. And, believing. And going through all kinds of, <laughs> of havoc in our lives. That's right. Um, but again, I want to get back to this name change. Right. Who is this guy, once again, from Hosea 12.9, that keeps giving these people Egyptian, Egyptian names, names that he's he sees face to face? That again. It's a man that he wrestles with. <laughs> that, should be the, that should be the title of the show. I mean, <laughs> and that quote, and it's not, it's not a coincidence, that was the first question, that was the first quote we dealt right. with. Mm -hmm. It's, hey, like, like we said earlier, these, these, these demons and these deceivers that tried to do all this deceiving over the years changed things around and switched, but you know what? We're always taught in any of our cultures, when you go back to Nubia, when you go back to Islam, Judaism, Christianity, because we know we were the original Muslims that came from Sudan, we were the original Coptic Christians and Hebrews that came out of Egypt. We were all, all these originally was out part of our stuff until the devil, the time who, whatever you want to call, disagreeable beings came in and took our information and switched it around, took the African out and put the Caucasian in and, and put white into everything and took black out of everything. But again, it goes back to Egypt, simple to the fact, in Hosea 12 and 9 again, he says his homeland was Egypt. Egypt. Right. And they left all the traces of Egypt in the Bible. With right. all their deceiving, Egypt stayed in there, the truth is still in there, but it's going to take a person with an open mind regardless. Now, a lot of us came into this information, into the Egyptian uh, Church of Christ. We all came from different backgrounds. Right. Some of us were Christians, some of us were Jews, some of us were Muslims. We didn't like everything we heard because right. we grew That's up. True. I was a Catholic. I came right. to this. And there was a lot of things that, you know, I dealt with when I first came in. It's hard. It's when you, you deal with something all your life and then this comes along. But if you have an open mind to, and research it, the facts and the information, it speaks for itself. Well, we were the first and we will be the last. Let me take you back to an ancient land called Tardites. Later called Mitzrayim or Egypt by the Canaanites. Welcome back. We have been talking with Brother Kafri Sa Atun about Egypt and its relationship to the scriptures. So, but we're going to jump right back into it because you're doing such a great job. And again, I want to thank you. Thanks I want to thank you for having me. Okay. Yeah. All right. How does Israel or Jacob, Jacob's favorite son, find himself in Egypt? <clears throat> uh, again, when you go when you go read these these stories, you'll see what the, you know with the story of uh, Joseph, how he got there. Actually, he found himself there due to his own sons because you'll see, as everybody's familiar with the story recorded in Genesis, how they were jealous of Joseph because he had dreams and he would always interpret his dreams as him being above all his other brothers. Mm -hmm. So it tells you in there they banded together, were jealous of him, uh, kidnapped him, sold him into slavery according to how it's recorded in the Bible to the Midianites who then sold him to the Egyptians and he was right. brought into Egypt. That's how Jacob got there later on because when, when you see later on when they weren't aware or Jacob wasn't aware that his son was still alive because he was told that an animal had devoured him, etc., as the story is recorded. But you'll see Jacob got there because later on he finds that 
Joseph was still alive in Egypt. He was the governor of all Egypt. He interpreted Pharaoh's dreams. He was one of Pharaoh's right-hand men. So he was told to go there again because, as we were talking about earlier, they were starving again over there. Right. So they were hungry. They needed food. Right. And again, it was told to Jacob in the Bible in Genesis 45, verse 26 to 28, go there for food. But also this Egyptian god of the Bible, again, Hosea 12, 9, told him to go there. And, and, and this Egyptian god or god of the Bible told him, I will make you a great seed there in Egypt. Right. So that's that's how he got there. Right. right. And Joseph takes him. So he, he himself goes and he takes all of his descendants. I think that's Genesis 45, 26 right. to 21. And also, I think, 46, 1 right. through 8, because they went twice. Right. There was. Um, but like you said, it had a lot to do with the famine. Every time it seems like a famine or somebody's hungry, hungry. Mm -hmm. um, they seem to go to Egypt because they knew that they had food and it was um, they were prosperous at that time. Uh, we also want to get on burial because that's something that right. we know was um, was very it was something that was very important to the Egyptians. Of course, you know, and um, in the Bible we see that Israel, Jake or Jacob, was also um, and Joseph also was given Egyptian burials. And the key word it uses in the, in that quote in fifty twenty six is the word embalm. Mm -hmm. And the process in ancient Egypt for, for mum mummification or mummifying a human body was the process of embalming, removing the fluids from the body, replacing it with certain salts, uh, also letting the moisture come out of the body and letting the body, in ancient Egypt it took approximately about 70 days for that process to take place. Mm -hmm. They also did these things and when you read it in the Bible, what does embalming or mummification have to do with any Hebrew you know, tradition when you get into the Torah. Right. right. That's the key word in that quote to keep in mind is embalm. You don't find it anywhere else in the Bible. And I'm going to read that. That's Genesis 51 through 3. It says, Then Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. So the phys physicians bombed Israel. Now 40 days were required for it, for such is the period required for embalming. And the Egyptians wept for him 70 days. Right. And again, the 70 days correlates to what we were just talking about a couple seconds ago. That's typically when you read in any Egyptian stories, right. if you read it, do any research or stories on mummification, it took approximately seven days. Again, another Egyptian concept that's, that snuck into this right. 50th chapter of uh, Genesis. Right, mm -hmm. right. And that was Jacob. And I think um, at the end of um, Genesis, what is that? Uh, 50 verse 26. 50 ver verse 26 is where Joseph himself dies. And he is involved and placed in a coffin in Egypt. It says, so Joseph died at the age of 110 years. And he was embalmed and placed in a coffin in Egypt. Mm -hmm. So these people, you know, Joseph, J Jacob, people that are very important um, in the Bible right. or in the Torah, here they are receiving Egyptian burials. I right. mean, how or why would a God that felt so badly about... Well, so, they say. so they so say. So they say. Right. right. But we know better. 12-9. Hosea 12-9. <laughs> but why would he allow something like that? You know. I mean, again, really, why, why there's the confusion and the chaos is quite simple. The translators did a number on us. Right. Uh, when, these, when these books were translated by people other than our own, they took us out of it and put themselves in it. Right. And then just changed the, no the names to Greek and Roman names, mm -hmm. changed the stories around, and now we got a, a, a misinformation on our people's history and, and ancestral lineage of the Egyptians, which the confusion starts, they took Egypt and mixed it in with the Hebrews and mm -hmm. the, the Jewish and the Egyptian stories got into into mind and now we got different interpretations. Right, right, right. right. Different branches. One, one thing where you, sex. coffin is nothing but another word for sarcophagus, right, by the exactly. way. Right, so exactly, sarcophagus. Just, don't, don't yeah, that put in. that in. And also something I skipped too is um, the verse fifty nineteen, where it says, it says, but Joseph said to them, do not be afraid, for I am in God's place. Yeah. And at that time, he was in, in Egypt. Egypt. So <laughs> once again, you know, it is clear to us, and we know that God's home, God's place of um, origin was Egypt. That's right. That's right. So, I mean, you can't get, I keep stressing that, that you <laughs> cannot get around the fact that the Egyptians, well, first of all, were people of color. That's right. right. And well, first of all, the first, and second of all, I'm sorry, were, were the first inhabitants of the planet from which all the other races come and from. It's and a scientific culture. fact. It's, it's not racist. Right. Fact. It's and not so, racist. Nobody else have those structures over there. Right. You know, uh, and none of these people that say they, these high scholars, or whether they be in, in Judaism or Christianity right. or Mohammedism, none of them are going inside the pyramids and giving you detailed, you know, instructions or detailed information on how they was built, That's right. why they was built, who built them, and That's things right. of that nature. You only have one being on the planet that is doing that. 
that's and right. that is our Supreme Grand High Defense. That to you, I refer to you. That's right. right. Wow. That's that's right. So he's true. the only reverend that has went inside the, the major scriptures and translated them word for word for his congregation. That's right. And so now he he has uh, made a feat, or he has performed the feat that no other reverend has done. So I mean, now he's 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 putting them on on the he's putting them putting I mean, them to the test. We've said that for years, real quick. I mean, Nation of Islam, Farrakhan never took time to translate the Quran. Yahweh Ben Yahweh never took time to translate the Torah. And any Christian denominations or churches, uh, Reverend Billy Graham, whoever, never took time to translate the New Testament. Why? I mean, right. if, if you're above them cultures and them, them religious schools of thought, should have your own translation of the scripture. That's right. true. And That's it's right important to know because, I mean, if you want your people to know the truth, then you must take it upon yourself to give that to them. You That's know, right. to word for word, like you said, word for word translation. Right. You know, it's there for us, and he shows us. Okay, this is the Hebrew word. Right. This is this is what they say, and also he will give you what King James says too, as That's well, right. to show you how it has been changed even more. That's so. right. So you can compare it. Right. right. Um, but right now we need to go we'll go to break, and we're going to come back, and we're going to do a conclusion and okay. close up the show. Okay. So viewers, please stay tuned. As the mysteries of Egypt intrigued you, the secrets of the pyramids and the scientists that built them. Well, now you can have these secrets. Now you can enter into ancient Egyptian order and learn who and what you are. Who built the pyramids? Why? Medicine. How could be the secrets of symbolism revealed to you? Enter the ancient Egyptian order now. Welcome back. We have been talking here on our show with Brother Kafri Sa Atun, and he's going to give us some closing remarks. So, Brother, please give, us, give our viewers some closing remarks. Right. I mean, <clears throat> basically, I think when we start at the beginning of the show, Hosea 12 9 pretty much you know, sums it up all. Uh, and the correlation of the show is to show you the connection between Judaism, the Bible, and Egypt. I think all three of us did a good job of that by going through the stories from Genesis. Even though there's a lot more, and we'll, you'll get more information on it as we go along later, but I, and, you know, I think that with, with with facts and truth, it will remove a lot of this ignorance that a lot of us are walking around with. Mm -hmm. It's not, again, you know, I, I just simply like to stress, it's not about what we like; it's about the truth. And I think when truth is revealed to all people, you know, a lot of things will, will fall into place and be a better place for all of us to coexist together. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's also very important to realize that. Like I said, this is just a two-part special that we're going to do on Judaism, but we're also going to do this with Christianity as well as Mohammedism to show you how all the three major religions tie back to Egypt, you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt. I mean, we're going to go step by step so that it's not, no room for doubt in your mind, and you can also follow along with us to prove to yourself so you don't have to believe us and know that all of this stuff links back to Egypt. It is just stories that has been changed around, names have been changed, places have been changed, but it all links back to Egypt. And if there's any questions that you have, feel free to call us at 404-761-0029. Again, that is 404-761-0029. Or you can email us at I, all eyes on Egypt TV at yahoo.com. That's right. And again, bro, I want to thank you, and you're more well, than thank welcome. Thank you so much. Thank Come you. Back. Enjoy yeah. being here. Thank to the studio you. again anytime, man. Thank you. You're a wonderful guest to have. You always do such a good job when you come visit thank us you. on our studio. So please stay tuned. We're up and coming. We have Egyptian Tone that's coming up next. So please stay tuned. Welcome to Egyptian Tones, the ultimate music and music information source for awakening minds. The source for New Orpian entertainment, showcasing new artists, celebrity interviews and performances, original concerts and entertainment news. Stay tuned for a sneak preview from The Messenger, Nifu Amenhotep, coming to you from Hathor Records and York's Productions, performing Let There Be Light. said, let there be light, and the darkness didn't comprehend it. Darkness is knowledge, and he didn't understand my ignorance. For I am light associated with right, yet not intelligent. I breed chaos and ignorance, the part of me that's unknowing. But I'm willing to transform into an intelligent being. I once was blind, but now I see. Here's how knowledge let the ignorant be. Our knowledge, our limits. May I explore your universe? May I explore your inner thoughts? Feel your vibration. 
Getting 